when I was 17, 14 up, I still thought to myself, right, just keep focused, don't get ahead of yourself, you only need one more frame. This looks good, it looks yeah. very good. I thought this is my chance, this is my time. When I got down to the pink and black, I was thinking of my father. I'd loved him to have been there to see me win. Just the black, 20 for a famous, famous victory. And I was thinking there was no way in the world I was going to miss them two balls. Absolutely incredible! Your, your father, unfortunately, died when you were 16. Um, what were your last words with him? I think my last memories I can more or less think when I was speaking to him at his bedside. I said, hopefully I can go on and achieve big things and, and, and make you really proud and happy. And he said, I'd, I'd like you to be world champion one day. And I said to him, well, hopefully I will be. It's just a matter of when. Very kind, very generous. Um, got a lot of time for everybody he meets and just a generally lovely guy. He even laugh and joke when he's playing you, but um, he's focused and beating you, no, make no mistake. If you're starting off with nothing, believe you me, it'll make you try hard. There wouldn't be a player in the game that's not absolutely delighted for Mark. You, you just have to take your hat off to somebody who's grafted his absolute Niagara's off. <laughs> One of the best match play animals you're ever likely to see. He's got great bottle, Mark. That's, that's the, the big thing about him, and that's what you need to get to the top in this game. Yeah, they all want to win. Everyone wants to win. But who's going to go to hell and back and make sure that no one beats them? That's what separates the men from the boys. This is the story of what it takes to be a world champion. It's a tale of dedication to a sport and how a lad from Leicester turned tragedy into triumph in 15 years, the time it took to keep a promise to his dying father. Mark Selby turned professional at 16 and set his sights on becoming the best snooker player in the world. The jester from Leicester kept his promise. We're at Barnsley, uh, heading to the Metrodome for the qualifier, first round qualifier of the international championships. Uh, it's one of the, the bigger tournaments on the calendar. Uh, the prize money is fantastic if you go on and win. I think it's probably 100,000. I think it's the same as what the, the UK championships is. I mean, I don't really take anybody for granted, whether they're a, a household name or whether they're not. Uh, I just go out there, focus on my own game, give it 100% and, and hopefully that's good enough. But yeah, I mean, always try and take the positives, try and think of matches where I played really well and how I felt and, and try and take that into the, into the next game. It was only a few days ago on the Sunday, Leicester beat uh, Manchester United, which was a fantastic win. And the break on for Richie Delatte, who's got Vardy up ahead and free. Vardy could win it here for them. He scores! I wasn't expecting too much. I'd have took a draw, but 5-3 is uh, fantastic. Leicester City's played quite a big part in your interests. Yes, uh, they have. I mean, they've been brilliant to me. When I've won my big major tournaments like the Masters and the UK uh, and even the World Championships, they've let me go on the pitch at half-time and parade the trophy. <laughs> if somebody had said to me you'd be winning tournaments parading it around Leicester City football pitch, I'd have sort of like, had to pinch myself and said they was joking. He texted me before and he said, I'm, I'm, I'm coming on the pitch at half-time. He, he said, you did it, didn't you? I said, yeah, I did it when I won. I said, I'll try and make sure all the lads don't boo you anyway. So uh, he came out on the pitch and it was fantastic there. And, and uh, to be honest with you, the Everton fans were absolutely brilliant. They all stood up to a man and gave him a round of applause. And it was a big buzz for him that day. I texted him afterwards and said he milked it too much, but there you go. Mark, you've dedicated your life to snooker. You've won heading towards £3 million in prize money. How's it changed your life? Yeah, uh, financially it's, it's changed my life massive uh, from where I was brought up when I was younger to where I'm living now. I'm living in the countryside now, which I never thought I'd be able to say. Yeah. 
here we are. This was my old house. It's not changed that much. Uh, I still remember this room at the top was sort of a, a box room. I had my, my, my father when I was five years old. He brought me a snooker table for my birthday. I still remember walk, walking into the room. I had little birthday cards on there as a surprise. And yeah, for many years, I used to just be in there just trying to pop balls and improve myself. And just seemed to pick it up quite quickly, really. And uh, my father never really forced me into playing it. He, he just wanted me to be happy. But as far as I was concerned, from uh, five or six years old after that, I knew what I wanted to do. Your, your mother sort of split the family up. You had a really hard start. How old were you when, when your parents split? Yeah, I, I was eight years old when, when they both split up. M my mum left me and I was just with my father and my brother, who was eight years older than me. Uh, so it was tough because uh, having no mother in my life and my dad at the time couldn't really cook, so it was quite difficult. We was having takeaways quite a lot until he sort of like learned and I was trying to help and, and, and dig in and pull my weight as well. So it was difficult to try and focus on snooker and just like let that be all I ever wanted to do, knowing I, I had the heartbreak of my mum leaving me at that time as well. When I first met Mark, he didn't really speak about it a lot. Um, but it took quite a long time for him to open up about it all. Um, and when he did, he found it a lot easier, obviously, to talk about more and more. Um, obviously, took me back to where he, he was originally from, where he lived with his dad. I still always come back uh, quite often. I've been here with Vicky a few times and her parents just to show them where I was brought up and where I used to live. And, it's always nice to, to see where I've come from and, and never forget your roots, really. What's it feel like? Uh, a, a little bit surreal, uh, especially knowing now what I've achieved and, uh, and how far I've come to, to where I'm living now, to where, I've, where I come from. But I mean, that's why I probably come back so much because it seems to, to keep me grounded. It gives you that extra little bit of steel if you come from nothing because things haven't been handed to you on a plate, then you have to be that little bit better. And you have to sort of, it's quite good in a way to be yourself against the world. My father was a member here for, for many, many years. He, he would just come in here, play with his friends and have a couple of pints of bitter as he used to do. And I used to come here with him every weekend, really, uh, from when I was probably eight or nine years old. With it being a social club, it had to go before the committee. My father put a word in saying, is there any chance that I can come here and practice? And probably for at least a year or two years, I was playing here. They bent the rules a little bit for me to play. And for a long period of time, probably for at least a year or two years, I was playing here. Then I started getting better and better, and then I was beating the local members who used to come in every Saturday dinner and enjoy their game. And I think a few people put a few complaints in and then it sort of went before the committee and, and stopped me from playing and I had to go elsewhere. Fortunately, one of the stars of the 80s snooker boom ran a club with his brother in Leicester. Perhaps I ought to chalk it. Well, my late brother Malcolm, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, he, he took a shine to Mark when he first came in. And Malcolm could see potential. I couldn't see the potential, to be perfectly honest. When I was nine, ten years old, I went to, to Willie Fawn Snooker Club, uh, just going once a week after school. You're just lucky if you've got a snooker club in the area and you have people who can see the potential in you and will nurture that and help you. And uh, certainly the Thorne family played a big part in uh, Mark uh, getting where he is today. Malcolm thought, well, I'm going to take a chance with him. And he sponsored him and things like that and took him to all the tournaments. Playing against better players to try and improve and, and funding my career, really. He was a couple of years older than me, but when I went to sort of junior tournaments, he was always there practicing and if I was in the same tournament he was normally the winner. I could see we could be a good amateur player but I've got to be perfectly honest I didn't think he'd ever make it as a pro. Aware of a perceived lack of natural talent Mark dedicated every possible moment to making himself a success and still does. His work routine is incredible. Love practicing. I never did. I had two hours in the afternoon maybe or maybe an hour in the morning. Three or four hours was plenty for me. Mark Selby, he was there from night 10 o'clock in the morning and went home at 8 o'clock at night and just have a, a soup and a sandwich now and again. 
about nine or ten, I was making 60 and 70 breaks. First century at 11, I had my first 147 at 15. I probably wasn't as good as some of the youngsters around that age now. I don't think I was naturally talented as a, as a lot of the players, uh, but in a way I probably prefer it like that because I know that I have to put the hours in on the table and, and, and put the hard work in. He's the best at what he does. He's the best all-rounder and, and that's why he won the World Championship and I think he deserved it. You can tell he, he's worked hard at it and anyone that's willing to put the kind of work he, he's put in deserves to win the World Championship. You know, he's so dedicated, the most dedicated snooker player I've ever seen. What were you doing about school at this time? Because you're spending so much time playing snooker. Yeah, I mean, I was still going to school up until the last year. I didn't go at all uh, for the last year, so I didn't take no GCSEs, no exams. Uh, I used to go to the local snooker club once a week with my PE teacher, uh, John Warner, every Thursday after school. Uh, and playing for two or three hours and he, he sort of done wonders for me, he put a word in with the headmaster to sort of tell him the potential I had uh, and, and they said that I can start getting taught from home which was great because it was three or four days a week at home. They were setting me the work and sometimes I was doing it, sometimes I wasn't but uh, but yeah I mean that just gave me more time and freed myself up for more time to play snook and give myself a better chance. In the autumn of 1999, when Mark was just 16, tragedy struck. Mark's father, David, died from cancer. He, he got really ill quite quickly. He got diagnosed in, in the middle of September. And by the end of October, he sadly passed away. When I was speaking to him at his bedside, I said, hopefully I can go on and achieve big things and, and, and make you really proud and happy. And he said, I'd, I'd like you to be world champion one day. And I said to him, well, hopefully I will be. It's just a matter of when. Devastated by the death of his dad and having no contact with his mother, Mark was forced to leave home. His future looked uncertain. I was quite fortunate to have a really close friend who sort of took me in and, and classed me as one of his own, Alan Perkins, who I still see to this day. Uh, and I owe a lot to him, so I, I was living with him for maybe three or four years while I was still trying to achieve my goal. Alan remains a close friend. At the time, he offered Mark stability and endless hours of snooker practice. It meant that just two months after losing his father, he felt ready to turn professional, and at just 16 years of age, Mark became the youngest on the circuit. I don't know if you can. Oh, on this. Yes, please. Thank you very Thank you much. much. In you. his early professional days, the then world champion would be guaranteed a place in all the major tournaments. Yeah, it's just a matter of just keeping your arm in, really. You've done a lot of the practice back home, so just keep him warmed up, ready for the match. I can't say too much because my opponent's on the next table, so I don't want to give too much away. But in today's game, under the leadership of Barry Hearn, everyone has to qualify, and that's not always so easy. Well, they're going in, that's the yeah. main thing. Oh, there's a different game, though. Do you get nervous at all? I do, yeah, even to this day. If I was going out to matches and I wasn't feeling nerves, then I'd be worried because it still means something to me. As much as like I'm playing every day and somebody like yourself could probably watch and think, God, he makes it look quite easy, but then at the same time, if I didn't pick my queue up for four or five weeks, I'd come to the club and I'd feel as though I've never even played the game before in my life. I mean, it's one of them games where, same as anything, you need to be on top of it all the while to, to make it as easy as what it is. In this qualifying match for a place in the Chinese Open, Mark faced a rising star, Oliver Lyons, in the best of 11 frames. Big money at stake in China. All seemed to be going well, Mark eased into a four frames to nil lead. But then, as the master of so many comebacks himself, he suffered a shock defeat. Incredibly, he lost six frames in a row. Before heading home early to his wife, Vicky, there were some words of encouragement for his rival. Yeah, to be fair, I know I went four nil up and I played quite well. Bird play like that, into you play well. Yeah. Very well. Yeah, That's how you took your chances, didn't he? Yeah. Didn't really miss much. Get your head on, mate. Cheers. Keep practicing. Yeah. All right, bud. See you later on. Hello. You're right. Yeah, I'm just leaving now, so I'm just gonna. It shouldn't be too long. Probably hour, hour and a half, and then I'll be back. 
All right, I'll speak to you later. All right, love you, bye. Bye. It is tough being away from home a lot. Being away from Vicky. The mileage you do, I mean, it, is, it can be a lonely world. Now I'm on my own, I, I just organise everything myself, so going to tournaments, it is difficult. Vicky used to travel with me sometimes, but with us expecting our first child, that's not going to be the case, so I'm going to be going on my own a lot more. So what is this building? Uh, it is the National Theatre Ivan Vazov. Ivan Vazov is a famous Bulgarian uh, writer. Oh, wow. Vicky's told me I need to try and get some little present from Sofia with the name on, because that's what we're calling our daughter. As we speak now, you're expecting... Um, that'll be an interesting experience for him, becoming a dad. <laughs> it will, yes. We're just five weeks away, so yeah, it's all very exciting at the moment. We can't wait now. Mark is not the only talent with a queue in the Selby household. His wife, Vicky, is a former international pool player. She was captain of Ireland for 10 years and won the UK Championship. During this time, she met her perfect partner. Please give it up for Mark Selby! In 2006, I played in the World Pool Championships and we got to know each other a bit better there. Mark's focus is on snooker, but he would occasionally play in pool tournaments and in 2006, he won the World 8 Ball Championship. What a shot from Selby yet again. He does not disappoint. And 22-year-old Mark Selby. Selby is on top of the pool playing planet. You got proposed to on the Grand Canal at Venice, so he's a bit of a romantic on the quiet, eh? Yeah. <laughs> and he can't swim either. No. <laughs> so getting down on one knee on a gondola was pretty impressive. I can swim depths, but I can't do lengths. Well, it was one of the best days of my life, so we had a fantastic time there. It was so busy, I was sort of getting more and more nervous, and I thought, well, it's either now or never, so I managed to pluck up the courage and do it, and, and thankfully she said yes. For Christos, Christos, thank you, thank you. The PTCs in general, they're great to go to a lot of different cities in Europe, like here today in Sofia. Okay. They're very okay, difficult okay. to win with it being such a short format. Only best of sevens. I mean, the tour's probably as tough as it's ever been now for a, a long time. There's so many great players on the tour, so to win one is a, a huge achievement. Ever inventive Barry Hearn has brought some new ideas to the professional tour championship events, including the quick fire best of seven frames. Many think it has increased the chances of an upset result. The idea of the Pro Tours was open it to everybody. Logistically, means you had to sandwich the event you know, over a few days, and that meant short formats. That gives us more shocks normally, encourages youngsters to say, There is a chance for me. I haven't just got to wait for the big ones. Uh, and it works, and it, it's always worked in every event I've done. The World Snooker Tour has grown quickly from just nine tournaments in 2009 to over 30 by 2014, and with it considerably increased prize money. The Bulgarian Open is a good example, 128 players down to the winner in just three days of competition. Mark, faced with four matches on his first day, had to survive a big scare before beating Barry Pinches 4-3. The sport becomes a bit more vibrant, that was the whole point, trying to put some energy into a game that I was passionate about. Also creating the opportunity for the next Mark Selby to come through, and I think we're beginning to see that now. Mark looked in good form in Sofia and won his next five matches to set up a quarter-final against the former world champion Sean Murphy. We've all got our friends on tour. Mark would be one of my best mates. We've grown up together, starting out in the junior comps. 
used to try and beat the hell out of each other every weekend in some junior tournament up and down the country. But we've become good friends. It was, it was a tragic loss when Mark lost his father. We all felt it around the junior circuit at the time. But you know, it's, it's tribute to Mark and his character that he just dug in. And uh, when he did win the World Championships, you know, myself and my friends, we were watching it together. We were shouting the roof down for him because we were just so pleased. It takes so much to win that tournament. And I was so proud of him. With a semi-final place ahead, Mark and Sean put their friendship to one side, and Bulgaria's expanding snooker fan base witnessed a great contest. It was the first of four frames, and Selby fell behind 3-1. He came back to 3-2, but 2005 world champion Murphy won to go through. Since the sort of birth of the European Tour, we've become a lot more used to matches like that because these matches are so short, quick first to four matches. You know, you can you can turn up, play well, be well prepared, and lose and go home. These events won't appeal to everyone. Doesn't really matter because it's the right way to go. Well, Mark Selby is the perfect pro. He plays in all the events. He loves to play snooker, and he's a proven winner. Disappointment over, Mark stayed to support his friend in the final and watched him lift the trophy. Champion. It's usually you with the trophies though, isn't it? Well, you know, you have to spread them out, don't you? You were 19 when you got to first final. Remember what that was? Uh, I do, it was the Scottish Open, I think, in, in Aberdeen, if I remember. How did the interview go? Uh, I can't really remember. I think looking back, even family and friends now were saying that when I used to interview, I used to speak 100 mile an hour and people watching would probably think I was from a different country. 19 years of age. You fought like a real man out there. Uh, just wait till everybody stops. Uh, yeah, well, five one down and I thought to myself, like, just go out and enjoy it. I mean, I won the last two frames to give myself every chance, but I could just never get one in front. I got level and every time I got level, David kept going in front, it was beginning to annoy me. £42,500 for you, that's the, uh, the biggest check of your career by a, a long, long way. Uh, yeah, it's not too bad. It won't be the biggest check because I'm winning the lottery next week, so... <laughs> well, congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. A very brave runner up there, Mark Selby. If anything, that probably made me more hungry knowing that I'd got to that, that close to, to win a ranking final for the first time, experiencing all the media and how it all worked, it sort of made me hungry to want more. Selby'd made his mark then, and uh, it was only a matter of time before he started winning tournaments. And then when he got to the final of the World Championships with John Higgins, he was 12-4 down after the first session. I went from 12-4 to 12-10, didn't really miss a ball, uh, sort of put John under pressure and I think it showed because he was missing balls what he wasn't missing the first day. Uh, and then unfortunately we got pulled off at 12-10. We had another two frames scheduled to play but time was getting on and, and we had to get away, get shower, change, change our shirts and have a bite to eat to come, come back for the night session. So I was pleased to begin in 12-10 uh, in front because it could have quite easily been 12 all going into the final session. I think he might have won that World Championship as well because um, he started to get the better of Higgins at that particular time. Mentally, John seemed to be just not with it, I think, obviously, because I'd won so many frames on the trot and the way I'd done it, it sort of threw him a little bit. At the time, he was probably the best player on the tour. And obviously, not being 12 all and coming out at 12 10, John seemed to go away, sort of regroup uh, and, and does what he does best. He came out at night and played great snooker again. Uh, I think I got back to 14, 13, what I can remember, and then John showed his class on the last four frames. He just had four frame winning breaks. I played really, really well the last three or four frames, but I knew he had something special, and I said to him after it now, in the, in the party, and I spoke to him after it, and I really did think I knew he was going to become world champion. It, he, players, you, you can just tell. The comeback against John Higgins was typical of Mark's determination. He just never gives up. It's a great quality. I've chucked it. There's absolutely no doubt about it. I'd be surprised if there isn't a player on the circuit who hasn't chucked it sometimes. And you just think, oh, I can't be bothered today, or I haven't got it in me, or I'm not playing well enough. Plenty of players have chucked it. He was well behind in that match, but he showed his stickability. And I think he proved then, once and for all, to himself more importantly, and to everybody else, 
that he was capable of being a world champion. I think it's fair to say that Mark's got enough um, calmness in his game that even if things have gone badly, that he, he's able to put them to the back of his mind and look optimistically to the next frame and plays as if there's no scoreline. You can't really argue with that. Uh, if you were trying to teach a young player how to play the next frame, it's don't look at the scores, don't worry how your opponent's playing, don't really worry how it's happened for you. Just look to the next frame as an optimistic start, even if it has gone wrong. The £110,000 that you got as runners-up, that was half of what you'd previously won. That must have seemed a lot of money at the time, yeah, even it did. by sports standards. I just tried to invest it wisely, uh, brought my first house a, a few months after, which I thought was a good investment. And I think I brought, Vicky who's my wife now, I think I brought her a, a, a flip-up bin, which I thought was a nice present. How did she take that? Uh, I think she took it very well, because the previous one wasn't in good nick. <laughs> He was originally tagged the Leicester Potter, but his obvious enjoyment of snooker and meeting people when he plays earned him a new nickname on the circuit. He's known as the Jester from Leicester. You know, I've been out with Mark. He's, uh, he's good fun to be out with, but he's, uh, he's no Jester when you're playing him on the table. If something funny happens, he's prepared to have a laugh and a joke, a bit like Dennis Taylor. He's not looking for it. He's not a Jester around the table as such, but he's got such a good sense of humour that he's able to relax and enjoy himself. Times have changed in snooker since his heyday in the 1980s, when the top players were household names. I don't think we'll ever see the days of 18 and a half million people watching Steve Davis and Dennis Taylor. The world has changed. The customer, the viewer has a lot more choices. It's our job to make sure that we are as entertaining and as technically brilliant as those players from the 80s. I would have liked to have gone back and sort of been a professional in that era. Uh, looking back, there were so many characters. Not saying there's not characters today, which there is. There's a lot of characters today, but with a standard being so tough, I think when they're out there on the table, a lot more of their characters seem to just be zoned in, where back in the day, you'd see like Willie, they'd be like going around the table whistling. Snooker needs personalities. Mark is a personality. He's getting a little bit deep now and not necessarily showing to the audience and. I know you can't be, you know, have a laugh and a giggle all the time, but Mark's one of those players that will smile at the crowd, will get the crowd involved. I think he's gone a little bit deep now, the fact that he wants to impress all the time. He doesn't have to do that. He's going to be one of the world's all-time greats now, whatever happens. While its UK platform is not so dominant outside the World Championships, the sport's popularity abroad is increasing. There are now nine different countries staging big tournaments. China is the most popular, where snooker stars are big celebrities. The players involved are now self-funding, so the risks are bigger, but so are the rewards. It's a global game now, and I think that will continue as we take and export a great British game. But at the same time, it comes at a price, doesn't it? It's expensive, you know, it's tiring, and they get no sympathy whatsoever from the chairman. I do that every day of my life, and I expect them to do the same. They want to be winners. They can talk about being winners, or they can be winners. Winners, like Selby, shrug off all this adversity, they get, they get on with it, they get the job done. The difference is, uh, and this is always a problem for the top players, they would love to just come in at the final stages and, and basically nick all the money, uh, but that's, that's the end of competitive sport when you do that. It has to be a level playing field, it has to be ability is the only criteria for success. It has to be tough, and I've made it very tough. The journey is just starting to recover the high ground, and I think we'll be putting a flag on the top of that mountain one day. Mark Selby's first major title came in 2008. He knocked out two former world champions, Stephen Hendry and Ken Doherty, before easily beating Stephen Lee to win the Masters. Going to the Masters for the first time, never even been there to watch in the past. Uh, it was, was a great feeling and, and to go on and win it on my debut was, was something I could only dream of. Before that I was always doubting myself, even though I got to the Scottish final, I was thinking was I a one-hit wonder, was it just a tournament where I just played fantastic snook and it might never happen again. 
But to achieve what I achieved in the World Championships and then to continue that on in the Masters was a great feeling and, and that sort of set me on my way really. Mark was fast becoming one of the top players. He lost to Ronnie O'Sullivan in the 2009 Masters final before beating him in the following year. Mark then added the UK Championship in 2012 before completing a hat-trick of Masters titles in 2013. But then a major setback threatened to end his career. I was in China, I think it was about four or five weeks before the World Championships. Uh, I woke up one morning, uh, gone to get out of bed and I felt a, a really bad sharp pain in, in the back of my shoulder. Uh, at the time I just thought I'd pulled a muscle or I'd slept funny. Uh, went down later on in the night, it seemed to have got gradually worse. I didn't know whether I was ever going to play snooker again. Nineteen ninety nine was Mark Selby's blackest year. His father was diagnosed with terminal cancer and entered a local hospice. Years later, despite those painful memories, Mark continues to put something back. Needs a clean. When Diane asked me to become patron of, of Law Ross, there was never a doubt that I was always going to say yes. It's absolutely amazing. Fantastic, not just for the patients, but also for their families. It makes it so special. It creates a lovely buzz about the place. Three, two, one. After 2008, the patients and staff began to see much more of Mark, who was now winning trophies on a regular basis. Then suddenly, on the eve of the 2013 World Championship, it looked as if his career may be finished. I was in China, I think it was about four or five weeks before the World Championships. Uh, I woke up one morning, uh, gone to get out of bed, and I felt a, a really bad sharp pain in, in the back of my shoulder. Uh, at the time, I just thought I'd pulled a muscle or I'd slept funny, and I thought later on in the day it'd probably wear off. I went downstairs for a practice, and I could, couldn't physically get down on my cue. You know, I remember getting the phone call. He was, he was very down, you know, it's as if he went into his own little world. I wasn't practicing, it was hurting when I was driving, I couldn't turn to the side. He didn't want any visitors, he didn't want to go out. He just sort of shut himself away because we didn't know what the problem was. And then I had an MRI scan and uh, they said that I had a, a disc bulge in between C5 and C6, which was really, really painful. And uh, at the time I didn't know whether it was I was ever going to play snooker again. Snooker's all he knows, so for him to think that he's not going to be able to play that anymore and probably not fulfil all his potential. Well, to come back from an injury, it's very, very difficult because, I mean, a few players have suffered with injuries and they never really recover, but that's down to the resilience again of the, of the player and the man and, of course, his, uh, the support he has from his wife, Vicky. I mean, Vicky was great, to be honest, as she always is. I mean, when I was there, I was like doing all, all my different stretches which the physio told me to do and, and Vicky was always trying to keep me positive. And to be fair, I was trying to believe that myself as well because I needed to try and instill some kind of positivity in me because my confidence was on the floor. If it's that bad, you can't put the practice in because above all else, you need to put the hours in in this game. That's one of those things. You don't just turn up and play. It's uh, something you need to be doing your, your four, five, six hours every day to turn up at. So it'd be frustrating for that. You wouldn't be prepared properly and then you wouldn't get the results because of it. So uh, unfortunately, like any of the sports, you know, whether it's that physical or not, you do need to be right. When did you know that your career would resume as normal? Uh, well, I went into the World Championships and I think I played Barry Hawkins first round. Uh, and the lady I went to see got me sort of getting down to be able to play. I mean, I was still in a lot of pain and discomfort, but I was physically being able to get down to a position where three or four weeks previous to that, I couldn't get in that position. So. Even though I lost and I was disappointed, uh, at the same time I was thinking, well, I've took major steps from where I was four weeks ago. It was really hard, especially I remember there was a couple of comments in the crowd, obviously about the way he was playing, and it, it was hard for me to listen to because I knew what he was going through sort of the last few months. Once I started practicing again, I sort of like got my confidence back knowing that my career was back on track. 
Yeah. Sorry, Bert. I was going to see these patients. Yeah, well, looking forward to it. I've heard there's always some City fans in here. Always. The former Leicester City midfielder and club legend Alan Birchnell often joins his friend to meet the patients. It's a formidable double act. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I better introduce him. <laughs> the handsome one. The handsome one. We just got friendly. You know, so natural, down to earth. And he's carried that through, you know, even now he's the world's number one. He's no different. Hello, Ron. I've known him for quite a few years now. I mean, my father always used to say he was a great player when he used to watch Leicester play. He said he was a fantastic player. And if you speak to Birch himself, he tells you what a fantastic player he was as well. They're heavy, aren't they, Ron? Yeah. They, they are, aren't they? They're even heavier when they're filled with champagne. He got any? <laughs> Me? He got any under the bed? Is he ugly or what? That's you. Oh, no. <laughs> it's not been easy for Mark. His father passed away in uh, this hospice so it's very poignant for him to come back here it's difficult for him but he still wants to give something back um, and that's that's why he's so special and in the last few years since he's been a patron I have to say his shyness has gone away a little bit and he's the one now who is having the conversations and asking the patients the questions whereas before it was perhaps again perhaps because of his father but it's him now who's having that fantastic rapport and, and making time and, and making it so special for them my father was here many years ago before he passed away it's always nice to give something back and this is sort of me giving something back to what they gave to me to look after my dad as well as what they did every player's ambition is to become world champion it's, it's the best feeling in the world it's just a grueling mental test for 17 days. It's massive. It is a brilliant tournament. It really is a, a test of mental endurance, strength, character, persistence, you name it, belief. As the 2014 World Championships approached, Mark was fully recovered from injury. He was ready to take his chances again for the sport's biggest prize. He came through some epic matches to reach his second final. The dream was now so close, but the game's most gifted player ever, Ronnie O'Sullivan, was in his way. Yes, you want to avoid him in the early round, but if you want to beat him, you want to beat him in the final. For a player that's had a few years knocking at the door, the job arguably gets harder. The final against Ronnie O'Sullivan for me was a fair fight. Everybody always gives the edge to Ronnie O'Sullivan, but like any great player, Ronnie O'Sullivan knows the types of players that uh, can turn him over. The last two years he's won it and uh, he's never been beaten a world final before, so going into that tournament I knew I had to get off to a good start and I'd done anything but that. A familiar story. Mark trailed eight frames to three, and then 10-5. Few now gave him a chance. I always thought to myself, just dig in there, just keep, keep battling. I mean, in snooker, you never know, just one ball can change your whole match. So at 10-5, I was thinking, just still keep believing, still keep believing. When he got to the final, he was absolutely shattered. I mean, Ronnie was the more sharper of the two players. And I thought, there's no way Mark can come back from this. Selby just dug so deep. He's got that ability to not be worried about how good or how bad he plays. I mean, Selby's just absolutely blessed with, I think, the game's greatest ever temperament. To go behind to Ronnie, I, I think everyone sort of wrote him off. He's got the determination, the grit, the belief. He's the best in the game at what he does. The last two frames of the, of the session on the first day was huge. I thought if I could win both of them and come out 10-7, knowing how physically and mentally tired I felt, and, and Ronnie, to be fair, probably played 70 or 80% of his game, I thought if I could get out 10-7, I felt as though I was winning the match. And I come out 10-7 and I said all to my friends and family, 
I'm quite happy with that. He was on the same floor as, as me in the hotel and him and Vicky were going down the hall. He was still behind but he'd won the last two frames and they were like a little boy and a little girl. They were so happy that and I had a, a sense that he was going to come back against Ronnie. Day two and Mark Selby staged a remarkable fight back that was to change his life. Only a few knew about the promise he'd made to his father David. To most, this was just another display of gritty determination. Once he landed on the pink, I've sort of told myself, well, I was 10-7 down before the start of the day. I'm still back in the game. Uh, but I looked at Ronnie's body language and he seemed to take a deep breath before he played the pink. And I was thinking, well, is he under pressure? He seemed to play a lot harder than what he needed to play. Ronnie O'Sullivan, nine. I couldn't really believe it. I managed to get up and, and potted a good pink and a good black to go 12-11 in front, and uh, that sort of gave me the, the spring in my step for the, for the last session. He took all the, the punches, if you like, that Ronnie threw at him and just kept in there. And I always remember that final session when Ronnie came out, he'd make 100. Now, a lot of players would have been blown away by that. But Mark came back and he'd make an 80 and a 90, you know, and he wasn't going to go away. It's rated as one of the best ever finals, certainly one of the greatest comebacks. After winning 12 frames out of a possible 16, a remarkable victory was almost his. When did you start thinking about the promise you'd made to your dad? Uh, well, it wasn't until really I was clearing up in the last frame, I don't think. When I was 17, 14 up, uh, I still thought to myself, right, just keep focused, don't get ahead of yourself, you only need one more frame. Mark Selby to break. Everything Mark had worked for, everything he dreamed of, everything he'd promised was now just one frame away. I don't think he ever forgets something like that. And to lose his dad uh, just as he turned professional, that would always be in the back of his mind. Listen, my mum uh, died suddenly uh, about four months before I won the World Championship. I won the Grand Prix and uh, it was a great inspiration because, you know, when you're sitting in your seat there and things are not going right for you, it's nice to have somebody to have a little chat to. You know, he made a pledge to his father, which is something I suppose lots of people have done over their career to, you know, at those difficult times, don't worry, Dad, I'll win the... Does it, does it mean that? You know, well, in his case, it, it did. When I was clearing up the last frame, I thought, this is my chance. When I got down to the pink and black, I was thinking of my father, and I was thinking there was no way in the world I was going to miss them two balls, knowing what he's told me. And, and this is my time. This looks good. It looks very good. 22. When the last ball went down, I'm pretty sure the first thing in his mind was, that one's for you, Dad. My father passed away when I was 16 before I turned professional. Uh, and I always said to him that I'd try and win the World Championships one day. And, and, and today's cup. With my interview at the end, I, I struggled to sort of get it out, obviously with all the emotions going through me, thinking of my father and obviously like where I've come from really, from a young age to get to where I've more or less stood on top of the world being world champion. And I just stood behind the curtains and in the commentary box behind Virgo and Dennis. And I, I've never willed anybody on so much in my life. If somebody's got something in their life that all of a sudden gives them even more of a purpose, um, and in a way takes the pressure off the actual personal winning, but makes it more of a team effort. If you can play for somebody else, if you feel like you're part of a team, I think to some degree it's easier to, to play snooker and win. There's no greater feeling in the game when that final ball goes in and you suddenly realise that you're world champion. I'm pleased for him because, to be honest with you, he'd have been, along with Jimmy White, the best player never to have won the World Championships, in my opinion. And uh, 
he's gone ahead and won it. He can relax now, his name's on the trophy. And uh, whatever happens, it's not coming off. There's a lot of people that once they hit their target are never the same player the day after. But there are some special athletes that when they hit their target, they get a taste for the promised land. And I think Mark Selby falls in that category. You're going to be seeing a lot of Mark Selby. You know, we spoke about it for so many years. And, you know, obviously every time a world champion comes past, it's another year that he's not done it. So for him to do it this year and obviously to dedicate it to his father, which was, well, the dream come true for him. And, yeah, just really, really proud of him. So here you are sitting, Mark, as world champion, enjoying life from a tough start. It's fantastic that you're able to keep that promise to your dad. Yeah, it is, and I mean, that will live with me now for the rest of my life. And I can take that with me, knowing that my last words to my dad were saying, I'll try and be world champion. And I managed to do that this year, so I know that he was looking down on me at the time, uh, and I can take that to my grave with me. That's a, a fantastic feeling.